You got a special kind of show But some points that it's never know It's just point to be some changes in your mind It's so profound and that's as well But not as much as we can tell Because you are the one who looks too far behind With no kind Welcome to Movie Rehab Are you sane enough to escape the show? Man, it's been forever since I've actually uploaded my previous episode in this series. Like, more than two years in fact. Just damn. Well, as you've probably noticed, in my previous episodes, I've reviewed movies that were either average, bad, or downright horrible. However, to keep on further motivating myself to do more episodes in this series. However, I have decided to take a look at four films that I actually well, that I actually like. Because you know, if I'm constantly reviewing movies that are only bad or average, like what would be the fun in that? Like it can be fun to take a look at a movie that is bad but enjoyably so. But if you have to look at movies that are either you know, average but also incredibly boring or movies that are so goddamn awful that, that this could add further depression like to your own mind. Like with my previous episode of being John Malkovich. Well, I just need something good to balance out all the bad. And you know what? The first few movies that I'm going to take a look at are movies that I consider to be, you know, underrated but also pretty enjoyable. Like, it's not nec those movies aren't necessarily films that I would consider to be, like, the best movies ever or something like that. Only, you know, but still, those are movies that deserve more, you know, they deserve more appreciation than they actually, you know, get. Now, the fourth and last film. That I'm going to talk about, however, is in my opinion an underrated. No, 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 scratch that. It's an underappreciated masterpiece. But as for today, I'm going to take a look at Dracula 2000. Dracula 2000 is a movie released at the exact same year as the title suggests and it was directed and story-wise co-written by Patrick Lucia. Back when the movie came out, it mostly received negative reviews and it was a financial flop, most likely due to being released during December. The freaking holiday season! Who the hell was responsible for the release date of this movie? The same hack producers behind the Psycho remake? As for opinions, not only do I genuinely like this movie, but I would also go too far to say that this film deserves more love. So, without further ado, it's time to take a look at Dracula 2000. The opening credits are set in the year 1897, and we can see a ship full of dead people with no one left to take care of it. And we also see footprints of an animal with each following step looking more like human ones. The reason as to why I've showed that to you is so that I can bring it up later again. Anyway, next we cut to the year 2000. You know, just that with a title? Huh? Huh? And at a play. Wait, what the hell is that place? Wait, I really need to lift this one up. So the place that looks the closest to it would be the King's Cross Station. You're allowed to correct me. Oh, I'm even encouraging you to do so because I would really love to know where and what exactly this place is. You know what? It looks pretty neat. Well, anyway, we then see a bunch of burglars breaking into the Carfax Abbey, the place of Abraham van Helsing, played by Christopher Plummer. Alongside with them comes Van Helsing's secretary Solina, played by the smoking hot Jennifer Esposito. Much to their dismay, however, they discover that the inside of the safe features nothing but junk. 
The only interesting object that catches their eyes is a coffin made of silver. They try to take it with them, but Van Helsing was anything but unprepared for such an occasion. A better phrase. You'll see what I mean later on. The burglar group then forces one of their guys, played by Mr. Hyde from that 70s show, to have an eye on the coffin, much to his dismay. Van Helsing then finds out about the heist, but arrives too late to stop them. We then cut to Mary Heller, played by Justine Waddell. She is one of our main characters, and she just woke up from a nightmare that felt too bad to be untrue. So she and her friend and roommate Lucy, played by Colleen and Fitzpatrick, aka Vitamin C, go out to get themselves into a better mood. Now if there's one thing that I can already praise about this film, that would be that this movie's soundtrack pretty much kicks ass. I mean, we get Power Man 5000, Disturbed, Slayer, Linkin Park, Pantera, Saliva, you name it. As someone who loves rock music, including new metal, this movie's soundtrack certainly feels like an amazing treat to my ears. This movie also rocks on multiple other moments, as we will soon discover. We then cut to a cargo plane. Inside said plane are the burglars from the beginning. Hyde is forced to open the coffin with no success to be found. There's probably cash upstairs! You bother looking. Unbelievable. Unbelievable! Not leaving without the prize. <laughs> what the hell? Has he just turned into Popeye for one second? Nine Popeye in the same After getting his shoulder tipped by a cartoon cloud, he discovers that the coffin has a simple rotary knob in shape of a crucifix. Hyde then opens the coffin, and after that, he has to deal with a leech on his eye, which looks pretty painful. For those who are wondering what's up with those leeches, well, Allow me to explain. Our dear Van Helsing keeps Dracula at his place because he hasn't figured out how to kill him for good. To keep an eye on the immortal being, he has chosen to lose leeches to suck out Dracula's blood to keep himself alive as well. It also serves as a clever reason as to why and how this movie is actually set in the early 2000s. This movie could have just said nothing at all and expect from us, the audience, to just take the story for granted. But this movie went the extra mile to be anything but simple. And I highly applaud Dracula 2000 for that. Hyde then discovers Dracula's body, but apparently that isn't nearly as interesting as a crucifix with rubies attached to them. <laughs> Greed can make you blind, but it can also make you dumb. Dracula then regains his strength again, and then returns back to his youthful looks. He turns Selina into one of his vampire brides, and oh yeah, he's also played by Gerard Butler, who I really like in this role. Most of his movies are pretty hit and miss to me, but anytime I come across a good movie that he stars in, those films are really, really good. For example, I really loved him in The Phantom of the Opera, which I know isn't everyone's taste, but this movie is actually one of my all-time favorite musicals. And I think that both his singing and especially acting performance was pretty awesome. But talking about that movie deserves its own review, which I will most likely do in the future. Back to the plot. Dracula causes the plane to crash. Before that, however, we see that Mary is sharing a connection to Dracula, which causes her to break down emotionally. I got to give major props to Justine Waddell and Fitzpatrick for their acting. There's something so wrong. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, Mary. I know it only lasts for a few seconds, but it leaves such a strong impact on my emotions, which should pretty much speak for how well handled this one short scene is. She talks about her fears and nightmare at a church with her listener being Father David, 
played by Nathan Fillion, who is best known for playing the title character of the series Castle. She tries to convince him to tell her about the confessions of her late mother to gain more knowledge. He tells her, however, that she never told him anything that would connect to her current situation. Fillion plays a rather minor role in this film, but he also adds a lot of likability into his character, and it's quite a shame that we don't get to see more of him. Though, I gotta say, his performance alone easily convinces me to check out more of his work in the near future. Nevertheless, it's still odd how his character wouldn't play a bigger role in this film, considering that he's a childhood friend of Mary and due to the religious theme this movie has gone for. I think it would have fit in perfectly to the story. Oh yeah, would've, could've. We then cut to a news reporter called Valerie Sharp, played by Jerry Ryan, who is best known for her role as the Borg Seven of Nine on Star Trek Voyager. She informs us about the dead pilot and presumed deaths of the other people inside the cargo plane and how their bodies had been taken to a morgue and how the coffin itself had been free of any damage. What, is this coffin made of adamantium? After the news, we get to see how Valerie and a cameraman are getting attacked by Dracula. And I gotta say, the fact that he's invisible every time he's on camera is yet again a very unique idea. I'm going to praise this movie a lot throughout the entire review, so you better get used to it. Dracula then kills the cameraman, and he also turns Valerie into one of his brides as well. Mary gets another illusion with Dracula again, which then leads her to leave the music store at Virgin's. I know it's called the Virgin Mega Store, but that wouldn't sound nearly as smooth sentence-wise, would it? Speaking of which... One major criticism I've heard amongst others regarding this film is that there are a lot of aspects to it that come off as dated, just based on the title alone, like the previously mentioned soundtrack, Virgin Records, and the fighting choreography that I'll be talking about later. So, this is a problem because... You know, there are people out there that like to claim that a movie... TV show, or whatever else, are automatically bad just because they are a product of their time. Me personally, I don't see it this way. I mean, don't get me wrong, a movie can suffer badly for having outdated references and elements, with the worst offenders being Zelzerberg with every single movie they've ever done, or every political theme movie about current political topics, but really... Even the classics that are considered to be masterpieces like Gone with the Wind, Taxi Driver, Metropolis, It's a Wonderful Life, and even The Great Dictator or Back to the Future, both movies that are amongst my favorites, have certain aspects to them that didn't age quite well over the decades. It all pretty much comes down to execution and how much the outdated elements are distracting you from everything else. Yes, there are moments that date this movie. Come on, the title alone promises you exactly what it says on the tin. And besides that, it doesn't really distract me from the overall story. And I've seen much worse offenders from that side. Seriously, the title itself invokes the year. Just like biopics, movies that are set in the past, and everything that comes with it. If anything, then this movie is an intentional period piece instead of an unintentional one. Hell, I take this film over internet critics doing out of place political jokes any day. And I still prefer this movie's late 90s, early 2000s soundtrack over crap like Eminem. <sighs> Sorry for that long talk. It just felt very important to me to vent over that topic. And now that we got that out of the way, it's time for us to return back to the actual plot. Van Helsing and his assistant Simon played by Johnny Lee Miller, then arrive at the building in which the bodies from the aircraft had been placed in. One of them being Solina. But as you can probably imagine, the vampire turned burglars, then tried to attack our heroic duo. So who would be amongst them but hide, of course? Uh, I'm sorry, man. I just know what's wrong with me. Uh, uh. Simon then has to deal with another guy from the plane called Marcus, whose eyes make it look like he's slowly turning into Judge Doom. 
Seriously though, this short scene has this badass plus funny moment. Sorry, sport. I'm an atheist. <laughs> God loves you anyway. Usually, I can't handle it every time I see someone getting stabbed in the eye or get them ripped out or whatever. But this movie handles it way more discreetly than most other examples by not showing any explicit imagery. Simon then wants to take care of Solina, but he's unable to do so thanks to the police that is about to arrive. Simon then asks Van Helsing about the whole madness that occurred a few minutes ago. Van Helsing then reveals that Dracula and vampires in general are real. He's a fucking twilight son. Due to Simon still not believing him, Van Helsing then gives him an elaborate backstory on how he, amongst others, tried to kill Dracula. But no matter what they did, they still couldn't get rid of him for good, which is why he made it his lifelong mission to guard over Dracula's body until the very end. We then also learn that Mary is Van Helsing's daughter and that she shares a connection to Dracula thanks to Van Helsing and the title of villain being Blood Brothers. Doesn't that make Mary the blood nephew of Dracula? That definitely gives the sexual tension between those two a way more unsettling mood. I gotta give this movie another plus point for subtle undertones. Speaking of which, Dracula then discovers how much times have changed and he manages to adapt into a new millennium right off the bat. That in itself is justified of course. Because not only is Dracula capable of keeping his usefulness in looks, but he's also able to keep his usefulness in spirit. Meanwhile, Selina has been taken to the police. They want to know what happened inside the building. Selina refuses to answer, however, and she then manages to creep those two guys out. You getting this on tape? Look at me when I'm talking to you! Also, becoming a vampire apparently gifts you with the power to dance like Michael Jackson. You've been hit by, you've been struck by a smooth <laughs> Van Helsing and Simon then arrive at New Orleans to look out for Mary, as does Dracula. The latter looks at her workplace, where every woman he passes by gets hot by his looks. Dracula then recognizes Mary's friend Lucy, and she then takes him home with her, and we get a nice little reference to Bella Lugosi's Dracula. Hey, can I, uh, can I get you some coffee or something? I don't drink coffee. His seductiveness then leads to sex, and he then turns Lucy into his bride as well, with Mary sensing his presence yet again. Simon then approaches her, but she doesn't feel like talking. Marcus then suddenly reappears, which leads to another fight between those two. Eye for an eye, mate! Never, ever, fuck with an antique stain. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Van Helsing then finds his way inside Mary's house. Unfortunately for him, however, Dracula evaded him, which then eventually leads to Van Helsing's death. Mary arrives back at her home, and much to her tear-bringing horror, she discovers the corpse of her father under her bed. And if that wasn't bad enough... You had him every night in your dreams and you never even shared. What do you have that we don't have? Dracula then reappears in front of her eyes while also putting another illusion into her mind that makes her hall look like the inside of a mansion. She tries to escape, but he then turns himself into a wolf. Yeah, I don't get it either. Maybe it's part of this movie's recurrent symbolism on religion? But otherwise, I don't know what this scene is supposed to symbolize. They have showed us those footprints at the beginning of the movie but it's never fully elaborated on. There may be a connection of Dracula selling his soul to the devil, but yet again, it's never really explained in this movie. Not once. 
After she got out of her house, we see Simon pulling out a gun, and even though he didn't miss his aim, Dracula then managed to turn himself into a flock of bats, undoubtedly inspiring the same special abilities for another Dracula movie that came out over a decade later, Dracula Untold. It could just be a coincidence, but honestly, I don't really care. I just find this parallel very interesting. Mary and Simon then try to study some information about Dracula at a church library. Gotta miss those days. Some of the people in my audience may be too young to understand what I mean, so allow me to explain. Back before the internet became way more popular in the early 10s, most people went into the libraries to gain more knowledge. Or they just went there to borrow books, VHS tapes, or sometimes even CDs or DVDs. Libraries are thankfully still a thing, and quite frankly, I am happy for that. Sure, they aren't nearly as popular as they used to be, but they still have a welcoming atmosphere, and it's way more practical to borrow your books there than with the internet, as you don't have to wait for several days to have your books arrive, and you can simply go back to the library and give it back to them in no time. No postal service and all. I admit, I haven't visited libraries nearly as often as I used to, but we should still appreciate them as long as they're still around. Life may get easier with each new idea, but we should still enjoy those traditional aspects for as long as we can. Because maybe someday, there's nothing else left, except for our memories. Simon and Mary then share a heartwarming talk about Van Helsing, about his father-like relationship with Simon, how much Mary truly meant to him, and how him defying death for such a long time was meant to keep the world safe from Dracula. Dracula then eventually finds Mary, which then leads to this nice classic vampire pose right here. Simon tries to find them, but... <laughs> Return of the vampire bitches! So tell me, do you have a dream about making it with a TV star? Well, I would definitely pop that cherry. We then get this nice Charlie's Angels pose right before Simon manages to kill Valerie. But Selina then KOs him immediately. Next, we cut to Dracula with Mary by his side. He's the one who's now pulling the strings. She can't escape his sharp teeth and... Dracula eventually turns her into a vampire. Yeah, I'm serious. No sunrise, no garlics, not a single interruption. This is one of those few exceptions where Dracula actually gets his bride. The religious themes of this movie has now finally come into full circle. Dracula reveals to Mary that he's actually Judas. Yes, the same Judas who was part of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. The man who then eventually betrayed him. The idea behind Dracula being Judas is just as unique as it is genius. The cross represents the man that he betrayed. The silver, the mark of his sin. Dracula was inspired by the real-life Romanian voivode Vlad the Impaler, which most adaptations also like to use the base Dracula's ruthless personality on, which amusingly enough Dracula until didn't do so, despite it being about the main inspiration behind Dracula's villainous nature. However, I just love the idea of Dracula being the man who betrayed Jesus. It delves more into Judas' psyche, and it shows Dracula in a light that has barely been explored in other adaptations. Dracula and his other brides then offer Mary to suck the blood out of Simon. She presumably does so. That is, until it's revealed that she actually didn't. It's just fake. You know, Mary didn't seem to have had put any second thoughts on whether or not she actually wants to decapitate the head of her vampirized friend. I mean, granted, she's a vampire now, and she was also one of the ladies responsible for her father's death, but... Eddie's little prank. Sorry about you. <laughs> we sucked him dry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, come to think of it, yeah, she did kind of deserve her death. But I still think that a 
more dignified way would have benefited the scene, though. Mary then stabs Dracula, but it doesn't leave much of an impact. She tries to escape, but with no success. While Simon got a fight of his own going on with Solina. Amazing. Now, let's talk about the fighting scenes of this movie. For the most part, they're pretty solid. But there are times where it suspiciously looks like they're trying to be like The Matrix, which doesn't really work for this film. The reason why it works in The Matrix is because it's a fake world versus real world scenario. And in this film, it doesn't really feel right. You could, of course, make the argument that the reason as to why those vampires are moving like that is due to their supernatural powers. However, it still feels very out of place in such an otherwise awesome movie. Mary then manages to outwit Dracula by hanging him from the Jesus Neon Cross, intending to let Dracula die the exact same way that he was reborn. He did, however, took her by his hand, and as the sun is about to rise, he lets Mary fall deep down to the bottom. Either that, or he just didn't have enough strength to hold onto her hand. She did survive the fall, however, thanks to her being a vampire. Dracula then uses his power one last time to release Murray from his curse. And after that, he turns into ashes thanks to the morning sun. The movie then ends with Mary choosing to guard over the remaining ashes of Dracula in case he shall ever return back from the dead, thus continuing the task of her father. The ending, however, also shows us that Mary hasn't been quite cured from a vampire curse, thus ending this film on an interesting note. The end credits then start to roll and... Okay, that audible transition was kinda awkward. Dracula 2000 is, in my humble opinion, a movie that deserves more love. The acting was pretty solid, with most of my praise going to Jared Butler and Nathan Fillion, who yet again left quite a strong impression on me, despite his small screen presence. Justine Waddell was pretty decent too, though I would say that sometimes she didn't emote all that much facial-wise, but it's not too much of a big deal to me. And besides, we still got Johnny Lee Miller to balance things out. The soundtrack of this movie freaking rocks. The visuals are incredibly great without any over-reliance on CGI, and this film manages to make the whole premise of a modern-day Dracula work, as it doesn't need to hide itself from its time. Dracula's vampire brides are pretty hot, just how they should be, but there are also a few other things that I need to bring up. A lot of people who have watched this film like to call it unintentionally funny, but what most of those people are not realizing, however, is that this movie is intentionally funny. Yes, for the most part, this movie goes out of its way to be serious. And yes, I occasionally made a few jokes at the expense of this film. But most of the scenes that people like to call quote-unquote awkward are meant to be humorous. Dracula 2000 is as serious as it is tongue-in-cheek. After all, this movie was co-produced by the late horror movie legend Wes Craven. Also, here's a fun fact. Jared Butler's performance in this movie has actually impressed Joel Schumacher so much that it eventually led to Butler being cast as the title character of the 2004 Phantom of the Opera film. I hope you enjoyed this review. And at last I gotta say, uh, maybe I'm funny, but my points are still valid. After over two years, I have finally made my comeback. 
Did he really though? Uh, yes, of course. You know, it's funny because this sounds like something you said at least like more than once. I may be a nobody amongst thousands of internet reviewers, but that won't stop me from doing what I love to do. Oh, wait a second. That's exactly what you did. And no, doing one review each year does not count as a comeback. What do you want me to say, Barnabas? I want you to be honest. Not only to your fans, but also to yourself. What state does your show currently have? Can you really call it a comeback? Or is it more of a temporary return? You want me to be honest? I don't know. I really don't know about that. I really don't know the answer. Like, I wish I would. But I don't. Only time will tell. Just be careful with what you're saying.